Oh, Steve, you figured out that you're. I figured out what I couldn't hear you over the mic noise. I'm sorry. I figured out what I said. Oh, you figured out that your fly was open. Oh, well, I'll get. Oh, is it? it? Oh, I didn't know I was wearing pants today. So <laughs> good to know. I put out that we were trying to fix this whole awkward opener. You know, the, the whole yeah, I read that. We open up we didn't show succeed. without really any kind of tagline or any kind of slogan that would stick so um i put out on twitter uh for people to send suggestions and ideas of you know things that we could open up the show with and the most liked one would win and that was the most liked one um your flies open so yeah i don't know i don't know how to read into that but that's what it is how are you doing steve i, I wouldn't know where to go with that either because like i said half the time i'm not wearing pants for this so how are you doing? Steve? No, just kidding. I am wearing. Look at I. Am, oh, I can't stress my legs that much. <laughs> You're gonna have to just take my word for it. I am wearing pants today. Excellent, excellent. I can't All right. speak. Uh, joining, us, joining us today, we'll say hello to these two uh, gentlemen real quick. Uh, Doctor Bowen, oh, how are you, sir? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Excellent. I'm excellent. Fabulous. Hope you are. Um, and uh, joining the show for the first time, Misha Popoff. Hello, sir. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. Excellent. Um, just like we'll, we'll get a couple things out of the way, and then we'll uh, jump into uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight. I just have a couple of things. Uh, Wednesday on the 21st, that's this Wednesday, Miles Powers will be with us. Uh, he, will be, he will be coming to talk about the protocol with – Jilly Juice, he actually tried the cabbage concoction. Um, yeah, braver man than braver man than I, but I can't wait to hear how that um, how that went. Uh, Black Friday is this Friday. Um, do you guys go out shopping for Black Friday? No. no I, I, you have to I take your it. life in your hands when you do that. That's not yeah, but you got to remember, I, I, I did retail. For I did retail for 20 years. So do you know how many Black Fridays I've had to do? Um, why would I want to go shopping on Black Friday? I can actually sleep. <laughs> Dr. Bowen, do you go out? Uh, no, no, I, I definitely don't. I, <clears throat> I don't like shopping that much. And Misha, you don't, you don't go out? No, my, my wife goes online. I wonder why would anyone line up at the store when most of the stuff most of the Black Friday stuff is available online now, and yet there's this mad rush. It's just crazy. I'll tell you why, because I'm one of those people. I am I am in line every year at one of these places, and it's the thrill of the uh, the hunt. You want to be – I love getting in the middle of it and going after and getting those those deals. I got a TV last year. I think it was a – I think it was a 50-inch, but um, it was 199 and – there was like three of them left, and I remember, I remember doing kind of like a shimmy, like a, a just a, a stiff arm or a fake out to get that last ticket. And I felt bad for a second, like a split second, but it quickly went away when I got home and put the TV up and and watched it. It all the uh, all the guilt left me. So um, yeah, oh, it's fair game. Yeah, I agree. Although oh, it's it's funny. Every year I every year we do this, I see at least one example of uh, two fathers that are in the like the kids stuff is really 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 brutal like the, the competition to go out and get like the play sets or whatever that they have going out and every year there's at least two dads that are having like a a, a full blown out wrestling match over who's going to get that last one um so i i'm glad that for that i don't have kids because that would be me i'd probably be in all kind of i'd, I'd be locked up on Black friday let's be real but i can't wait for this year because um I'm going after an Apple Watch. That's this year's uh, checklist thing. Even though I don't really need it, I just want one. So, um, why did I bring up Black Friday? Oh yeah, Black Friday. Uh, for here though, Black Friday, we will we will be joined by, uh, what's his name, Doctor Bowen, and uh, Angelus Domini. Uh, yes, can you, can you kind of explain real quick who who that is? Yeah. Uh... And I can try. Um, so uh, there's a, can we call it a cult? Is that what we should call it? There's a movement. I'm okay with uh, that. Yeah. Um, called the Congregation, International Congregation of Lord Rael. 
and uh, <clears throat> Rael is, uh, proclaims himself to be the Messiah. And of course, I don't agree. Uh, but um, he has uh, quite a movement, I guess, relatively speaking, on Facebook and on something called VK. And I've interacted with them a little bit, and we did a show on them a month ago, maybe. And uh, I guess I guess they didn't like it, which is great. Um, and he has is offered to come on and answer questions, I suppose, that we put to them. Um, but Angelus Domini, the angel of our Lord, is uh, he's he's the emissary of Rio. And uh, he he does the public a lot of the public speaking for him, and um, so yeah, I mean I'm I'm excited. Excellent, I am too. We can I tell. can't wait. One Messiah um, to another, I guess. Um, I just want to say real quick, uh, David McGinnis, I love you, man, but um, even I can't stomach anyone insulting the Great Apple. Um, so take these take these couple of seconds and just think about think about the what you said, and you know, hopefully you you'll come back and come around. You know what I mean? Five um, minutes to, to, of penance for your for your breach <laughs> of, of, of your heretical things there, there, David. And by the way, uh, you're 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 a Messiah, but I am officially the Pope of Agnosticism. So maybe I could be somebody's vicar for that. So no, well, I mean, gonna, no. I, you know, I don't know if it means anything, yeah, Steve, but I mean, you know, I, I went back and checked just to make sure, and uh, you know, in the Torah code, I yeah, you're you're Yahweh, so. Yeah, so I, I'm so wait a minute. So I'm Yah, I'm I'm Yahweh, and I'm the Pope of Agnosticism. I think there's a problem there. I think there's some kind of contradiction, but I'll, I'll work on that one. <laughs> oh, anyways, um, okay. Very existential uh, problems here. For uh, just two more things to get through, and then we're going to jump into the uh, discussion. I, you, you know, I love you, David McInnes. I actually, when I timed you out, I thought I could. It would give me a choice. I didn't know it would go for 300 seconds. So um, <laughs> it's a little bit longer than you need to uh, to think about what's going on. Oh, but uh, really. uh, it, was, it was a joke. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, on Saturday, uh, Friday Night Fights, we will be having another, another round. Uh, this one's going to be extremely interesting because uh, we have a guy that owns the website, nasalize.org. Um, it's brother Ernest. He believes that um, there's not really much he doesn't believe, but um, he will be having a conversation with Reds this Saturday. So Reds and and brother Ernest will be on uh, this Saturday's Flatterday Night fight. So uh, look for that. And he's uh, brother Ernest is debuting a new shirt. He's doing. He wanted me to let everybody know that he got a new shirt design coming out. So you'll get to see it um, Saturday. Okay, and then. Last but not least, on Sunday, the 25th, we have the Golden Nuns, which is the choice for video of the year, creator of the year, um, animation of the year, all of that stuff. On Sunday night, that will be at 9 p.m. So come and see who wins, who you guys decided. Uh, Digital Hammurabi is up for uh, two things in that category, and um, they're doing extremely well. Yeah, so... You might want to uh, might want to stay tuned on Sunday. Um, and I know you're you're you're. you're last time I checked, you were killing it in the uh, best uh, non sequitur best educator uh, <laughs> category. So if that trend awesome. continues, uh, well, uh, nice. Jake three D says, um, "F yes, non set. Give me proof. Need a good case for God." Okay, maybe we can do that today. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and jump into what we've got happening tonight. Um, we'll let these guys introduce themselves really quickly. If you don't know, uh, I can't imagine that people watching now don't know who you are, Dr. Josh. But anyway, go ahead and give them a um, refresher, if you don't mind, sir. Sure. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you guys having me on again. Uh, I'm Dr. Joshua Bowen from Digital Hammurabi. And my wife, Megan, and I, who is out in the living room, uh, we run the channel Digital Hammurabi on YouTube. We have Twitter and yeah, other stuff. But uh, we work in the ancient Near East, ancient Mesopotamia. Um, I have a strong background in the Old Testament and Hebrew. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of stuff that interacts with the Bible and with the ancient world, and we try to make it uh, understandable. 
Cool. Yeah. And um, Misha Popov. Sorry, Megan just about letting everybody know. Clicking something. What's that? I guess they can hear clicking. Oh, not. I don't hear anything. Okay. Steve, do you hear clicking? Sorry. Like a pen. Somebody said something like a pen. I don't have a pen, so it's not, I'm not clicking a pen. Oh. Hands up. Hands up. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Popoff, why don't you introduce yourself, sir, yeah. and um, let everybody know how you found your way to non sequitur. Yeah. Well, uh, um, I'm a, a writer. Uh, I grew up on a organic grain farm in Saskatchewan. That's due north of Texas, 40 hours north. I, I now live down in Texas with my wife and three kids. And yeah, I do writing and public speaking. I have a, a bachelor's degree in the history of science from, from way up there. And uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I've reached my first half century on this planet. I'm now 51, and I, I've always been interested in the Bible, but, but became much more interested. Um, and, and to my surprise, uh, Texas, Texas really isn't the... The, the, the panacea for, for biblical study, I thought it was, but that, that's beside the point. And, and none, nonetheless, I, I started writing more about the Bible. I used to write about agriculture. I, even though I'm from Canada, I was a USDA organic farm inspector for five years. Um, and that, that sort of got my feet planted on the ground here in America and then uh, eventually moved down here to Texas. And uh, to make a long story short, I uh, uh, came across this, uh, this, uh, these issues in the Bible in regards to salt and salt being a very important substance uh, back then and to this day. And um, so, yeah, I, I wrote an article and I've been seeing if Christian uh, sites were interested in it. And uh, some are, I've had some good interviews and I thought I'd, I'd broaden out a bit because um, as I suggested to you guys before we went on air here, um, this is of interest to, to, I think will be of interest to anyone, whether they're Christian or not, whether they believe the Bible has any credence as a historical document or not, because we all agree, well, it was written, you know, 1900 years ago or thereabouts. Uh, we're talking about the New Testament. So, so the, right there, uh, if, if something is discovered, you, you now have to place it within that historical context. You, you can't say, well, that, that's a later discovery or something, as we'll see. Yeah. You know, I'll get into the details when, when you're ready. But that's, that's what brought me to, to you guys Hopefully, some some healthy skepticism will rub off on me, and and maybe a bit on you. We'll see. And and that's why we brought um, we brought Doctor Bowen here because he he's actually a um, a biblical scholar and can you know, and you know, better better I think answer any any questions you might have in terms of you know things that deal with with what you're going to put forth or you know he he's able to kind of suss those out a little bit better than. Um, than we are because he's that's what he does he's a um he's a biblical scholar so i think it, it would be a really it's a really good kind of combo to have both of you here to uh to speak to that just curious though how did you find us uh simple searching watching videos and saying wow th looks like those guys might be uh, a good place to try this out and and frankly uh sort of that that approach uh i guess you're maybe familiar with the Hegelian philosophy that Karl Marx picked up on. It's the, it's the only, it's the one thing Karl Marx got right. And that, you know, thesis versus antithesis yields a synthesis. And of course he mucked it all up and, and, you know, ended up a bunch of people have been murdered over the decades because of that. But, but, but that principle stands. I mean, I could spend all day talking to fellow Christians and it's going to be great talking to the, the fellow Christian you have on here as a guest. Um, certainly. But um, to get that thesis versus antithesis, to actually seek that out, I think that's something, frankly, people avoid these days. I mean, you're gonna, you were talking mm -hmm. earlier, you're going to get this guy who thinks he's an angel of God. Well, great. If he's willing to come on this show, that, that's better than him going on any, uh, any, any like-minded network where they're just going to sort of pat him on the head and say, yeah, good for you. Um, so I, I, yeah. think, I think politicians and academics have all abandoned that, 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 that concept, that thesis versus antithesis, even if it doesn't yield a synthesis, they, they've abandoned that. They're like, I don't want to talk to people who disagree with me. And um, so, yeah, that, that's what brings me here. I think it's, I think you're right. I think it's a good thing that, that, that people don't, they don't really do anymore or they like to be stuck in their, uh, their echo chambers. And um, it, to me, it's really, it's really refreshing when people are, are willing to, 
Like last night, we had the guy that was that, that tells people to drink turpentine, and I'd spoken to him for probably three days prior to last night. He was wanting to come on to try to defend, um, you know, him telling people to drink turpentine because the guy's got sixty thousand people that follow him, and uh, that's a lot of people drinking turpentine. And when it came down to the show, he didn't uh, he didn't show up and so i went on and, and showed everybody where he confirmed it or whatever but I, I, he released a video today talking about you know haters and all of this other kind of stuff and he's just not willing to get outside of his comfort zone and be shown to possibly be wrong so he didn't uh, wind up coming on but an interesting thing i, I just want to throw this out there and then um michelle we're going to let you roll with um with what you've got to put forth today but i got a uh, i got an interesting email today from um someone big in the skeptic community and he had watched the the sphinx episode that um that i did and um it's really cool uh, michael you know michael Shermer. everybody in here's heard of michael Shermer, right i doesn't ring a bell yeah uh, dr bowen have you heard of michael Shermer? oh yeah mm-hmm he uh, he he emailed me today um bob is apparently really good friends with him and um sent him the uh the email and said that um it, it was you know it was had nothing but praise to say about um so i thought that was really cool that somebody like that was um was watching but you know watching me get buried essentially watching my ass get handed to me um over the sphinx it's always so, yeah. Uh, yeah, we all, we all that. yeah 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 okay all right uh misha uh why don't you take us through how um important or what you think is striking about the salt that is mentioned in the Bible and how that correlates to where we are today. Sure. Sure. Well, um, in the old Testament, salt is always evil. And at best, it's a metaphor for something eternal. Like uh, David's sons are said to have a, a covenant of salt, salt being a metaphor that it, it lasts, it'll outlast everything. It causes things to last. It, it preserves things. Um, so that, that's the best you get is something like, like a metaphorical good thing. Um, and other than that, it's neutral. There's a reference to the salt sea. But most importantly, in, in the Old Testament, salt is evil. So you have Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. You have in, in uh, I think it's in the, the books of Judges, you have King Abimelech salting fields. And you don't even have to, you, you can look outside the Bible to see references to salting fields. That's something you do when you, uh, if, if you're not going to occupy the land you've conquered yourself, you salt the fields to make them useless to your enemies so that when they return, they, 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 nothing will grow. Um, and by the way, the, the, the correlation nowadays is we use, you know, depleted uranium. Quite, quite serious about that, by the way. Some people think I'm making a, a flippant joke, but yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's how you destroy a country. You, uh, you, you render the land infertile forever. Um, so that's salt in the Old Testament. Um, it, it does rise above evil and, and becomes, as I say, maybe maybe something neutral and maybe even a, a reference, as a, a metaphor to something something good. But even in the reference of the covenant of salt that King David's sons supposedly had or did have with the Lord, um, the, the the salt as a metaphor isn't like this fantastic thing, right? It's uh, no one says King David or his sons are like salt. Right. It's just the covenant they have with God is a a covenant of salt, meaning that it lasts forever. Well, in the New Testament, there's a shift. And of course, it comes through the mouth of of Jesus Christ in that he actually says, you are the salt of the earth. And now now David was never salt. The the covenant he had with God was supposedly salt. Uh, But now there's Jesus on in his Sermon on the Mount. And everyone refers to Matthew. 5.13 5.13 for this, if anyone wants to follow along, but we're going to quickly depart from that. Um, and, and that's sort of it. It's You are the salt of the earth, and we should be, as Christians uh, following Christ, we should be salt and light to the world. And if you just read Matthew and, and also Mark, that's as far as it goes. So you'll see uh, bumper stickers and, and T-shirts, and it's in all sorts of sermons um, that telling us to be salt and light because we are the salt of the earth. Um, now, being the salt of the earth, people just think, well, that's, that's salt. That's common salt or table salt or sodium chloride. Um, and, and again, the, the metaphor being, while it lasts, it preserves things that last forever. 
But we're going to turn to Luke now. And in Luke, in his coverage of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and by the way, John doesn't even cover the Sermon on the Mount, but, but he, gets, he does cover this metaphor that we're about to get into. In Luke, he goes further. He says, ah, ye are the salt of the earth, and if salt loses its savor, then it's good for nothing. So far, we have a sort of a parallel coverage in Luke that we saw in, in the most famous coverage of the Sermon on the Mount being Matthew. Uh, but then Luke goes a step further, and he says, for when the salt has lost its savor, it's no longer good for the land or the dunghill. Well, when would salt be good for the land? Never. So what is he referring to? And we'll just jump right into it with both feet. He's not referring to sodium chloride. He's referring to potassium nitrate, which was referred to uh, since time immemorial as saltpeter or commonly just salt. Now, um, in Hebrew and Greek, they only had one term, which was salt for all of these substances, even sodium bicarbonate, which uh, is a white powdery substance that comes out of the Nile. That was referred to as a salt for centuries. And, and some of the etymology is, is lost, but, but it looks like going back to the Hebrew, uh, the, to my limited knowledge, perhaps your other guest will shed some more light on this, there, there was just one term, and it covered salt, common salt, saltpeter, which we knew existed back then, which was commonly confused with niter, which was the name they gave to sodium bicarbonate, which is just uh, baking soda, basically, that comes out of the Nile. They got the name niter from the Nile, N-I being the first two letters. Um, and it uh, turns out saltpeter doesn't come out of the Nile, and yet we went ahead and today we now refer to saltpeter. It, it, it's, it's a form of nitrogen, as I said, potassium nitrate. And now, of course, the most common form of, uh, of nitrogen that, that we use is ammonium nitrate. Um, but all throughout, whether we're in biblical times or in uh, medieval times or in the Renaissance or right up to the present, this substance, which isn't a salt, even though it's referred to as a salt, it has two uses. Uh, one, it's the key ingredient in fertilizer. It's, it's nitrogen that gives us the protein in our food. So what, even if you're eating a plant, uh, all that, whatever protein is in it, if it's a low protein plant or a high protein plant like soy, that the, the protein in it came from the nitrogen. And then of course you still need potassium and, and phosphorus to grow crops and a bunch of other trace minerals, but that doesn't matter. Without nitrogen, you'd have no protein. Your food would be just empty. The other use, of course, is for an explosive uh, potassium nitrate or ammonium nitrate. Uh, it, without the nitrogen, you, you get basically a matchstick. A matchstick just has sulfur in it. Well, when you, when you take uh, one or two parts sulfur, put some charcoal in it, and then six parts saltpeter, that's the accelerant. It oxidizes the charcoal and the sulfur, and you go from getting a, 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 a vehement flame you go from that to getting an explosion that'll launch cannonballs or, or bullets out of guns. And so my contention is, because um, right there, Jesus says, if salt loses its savor, it's no longer good for the land or the dunghill. My, my contention is, well, he couldn't have been referring to salt. We can just eliminate that because you don't put salt on the land or on a dunghill. And, and we can explain a little bit further. I think everyone gets the land part of it. You don't put salt on the land. You put salt. Peter which is a fertilizer on the land. And again, we'll, we'll get into the dunghill if you'd like a bit further explanation on that, but I don't want to trip things up right now. Um, so, so he's referring to saltpeter, and it fits because he says, when salt loses its savor, it's no longer good. Well, salt doesn't lose its flavor. In fact, going all through the Old Testament, as we just said, that was the only metaphor that wasn't evil. When salt is referenced in the, in the Old Testament, it's as a permanent thing, like the covenant, uh, uh, God's covenant with, with David and his descendants. Um, so this is a different type of salt. It's a salt that loses its flavor or savor, as it says in the King James. And guess what? Saltpeter, whether it's potassium nitrate or ammonium nitrate, it does lose its flavor. And by the way, it's not a flavor you want to try. It'll, it'll poison you. <laughs> although it does appear in some foods, but it's in a, a different form. Still bad, as you know, nitrites can cause cancer, so, so don't mess with them. 
no one should try tasting it, but they used to taste these things. And, and, and all they knew was that it wasn't sweet, so they classified it as a salt. In any case, this is a, a salt, not really a salt, that does lose its flavor. Because what happens, where does all the nitrogen go? After it goes through the food cycle, through all the digestive systems of cows and sheep and chickens and humans, all the nitrogen, first it, it goes through the waterways, but all of it returns to the Earth's atmosphere. Sooner or later, it all returns. And the Earth's atmosphere, as probably a lot of you know, is 70% nitrogen. Turns out things like oxygen are really just small trace <laughs> ingredients along with carbon dioxide. In any case, there you go. The Earth's atmosphere is 70% full of fertilizer and an explosive ingredient. Um, so what this means is Jesus was referring to something that can, and we know does, lose its flavor. So that's the second piece of the puzzle. First piece is you wouldn't put salt on the land or in a dunghill. Second piece is salt never loses its flavor. And if you were anyone reading their Bible would know that, but you'd also know that just from life experience. The third piece of the puzzle is um, all of them, even John, who doesn't really cover the Sermon on the Mount, they all refer to salt and light. So being the salt of the earth is one thing, but to be salt and light, how do you get that from common salt? Well, you don't. And that's why most people have just always assumed it was some kind of loose metaphor that Jesus was making and that uh, he meant two different things. He meant salt, common salt, and light. How they're related, they're not. They, people just assumed, well, as I say, it was some sort of loose metaphor. Well, if it's saltpeter, then it's one metaphor. It's a type of salt, what they referred to back then and all up till the Renaissance, what they referred to as a species or a type of salt. And it does give light. It burns with vehemence, as early natural philosophers said. And it doesn't actually burn on its own. You, you need the sulfur and the charcoal there, but it, it's the oxidizing and it, and it provides oxygen to, an ex, to, to a flame to the point where it, it'll become an explosion. So all of those three pieces fit and it fits with all four gospel accounts. As I say, even John, who didn't cover it, ends up using this metaphor of salt and light. So I think the Bible has more than one meaning. I think you can still use salt to convey some sort of spiritual meaning to guide people in their lives. But uh, I'm embarrassed to say it took me uh, you know, about 30 years to figure this out. I was in a Bible study 30 years ago in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, where, where I was first discussing this with a, a, a great uh, uh, pastor up there. And I just went away wondering, shaking, what did Jesus mean when he said, if salt loses its flavor? And yeah, well, I, when I turned 50, I, I, I think I finally figured it out. He, he wasn't referring to common salt. He was referring to salt. Peter, the most important fertilizer, and the key ingredient in uh, gunpowder. What is the um, what is the significance of that? Like, what is what does that mean that you when you say that you found the um, what Jesus was was referring to when he said salt of the earth? Like, what what are the because he's not talking about you know table salt or and he's talking about salt Peter. Well, what does that mean for everyone now? Like, that, what what's that? What are the implications of that? Well, um, first of all, the metaphor now ties together. As I say, it's, it's, it's one metaphor. You're not supposed to mix metaphors, right? So it's not two. He's not making two metaphors. It's one. And of all people, again, even people who don't think Jesus is the son of God, I mean, we're, we're going to admit, the Muslims admit, he was a great prophet. He was a brilliant man. The accounts of him teaching the, teaching the, the priests back in the temple when he was nine years old. I mean, this, this guy knew his stuff. So... He wouldn't mess things up. It would be us and perhaps his disciples who might mix things up a bit. So that's the first thing. It, it ties together the metaphor. Um, the second thing is, if, if, uh, if we believe Jesus knew the beginning from the end, that this really comes home to roost for, for Christians, um, it, then, then he knew it was not only an important fertilizer that's good for the land and the dunghill. And again, we, we can explain the dunghill further if you'd like. But the land that, that he knows this is this is the salt that's good for the land. That's not that other salt that King Abimelech put on the land of his enemies. So that's the first thing. Um, then then the second thing is 
since he knew the beginning from the end, he also knew the other use that saltpeter would have. And in fact, I argue um, in some upcoming articles that are a follow-up to this one, some people think saltpeter wasn't discovered until about the 13th or 14th century in China. But I've, I've found research, uh, Muslim scholars and Chinese scholars that say, no, 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 we're looking at the fourth century BC for the first known instances of a saltpeter-like substance being used, being used mainly in warfare, by the way, because uh, again, even though Jesus knew this was the most important fertilizer, most farmers didn't know. Uh, even, even to this present day, a lot of farmers don't know what they're doing. They're just doing it. So if you had a compost pile and you were composting manure, uh, all you knew was that it worked. You didn't know that you were capturing this substance from the Earth's atmosphere through plants and feces, which would then compost into a usable nitrate that would uh, be used on the land. In any case, so the, the upshot is Jesus knew this was a fertilizer, not a salt. And I say he also knew, as I think other ancients did at the time, that this was a, a weapon as well. Now, Jesus isn't going to have us go out and conquer anyone. So the obvious conclusion, again, even if, even if you don't think he's the son of God, the obvious conclusion for, for consistency with, within the words of Jesus is that he, he's talking about self-defense. He's talking about, mm. not about attacking anyone. He's talking about self-defense. And, and uh, that's certainly something that has, has come to pass. I would suggest. Let me um let me bring uh, let me bring Dr. Bowen in here. Um, since you you are a a studier of or a scholar of the uh, the text, is there any light that you can shed on uh, what's been said so far? Anything you want to add? Yeah. So, I mean, there's no question. Um, there's no question that the biblical text, both in the Hebrew and the Greek. Uh, will oftentimes have a, a single word uh, that refers to a, you know, a myriad of things. So the word dog, for example, in the Old Testament in Hebrew is the word for fish, but, you know, it just, it just means fish. So it can refer to all kinds of things that swim in the, in the water. Um, so in that sense, you're absolutely right. Um, they're going to use the word melach or um, salt in the Hebrew and, it's, you know, it can be fertilizer, it can be um, salt for food. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's similar to the Akkadian. The Akkadian has a similar thing. Um, and it's, it's also true in the Greek in the New Testament. So halos is, um, you know, it's, it's halos, salt yes. and it can show up as, you know, what you put on your food to give it taste. Um, it can show up as, you know, fertilizer, it can show up. There's a number of things. So that being said, there are a couple of, I think there are a couple of things that you'd have to wrestle with. Um, and I, I kind of like to, to say things like that uh, because I, I, I don't ever like to say, generally speaking, I don't like to say that's not right. Um, but I, I, I feel like there are hurdles maybe that we, we'd have to overcome. Um, so a, a couple of things. First, in the Luke passage, um, there are some problems with not taking it as edible salt. So um, the Greek word that's used there for tasteless is followed up, and I'm just looking at it here in the Greek, um, by the word, uh, so that the text says, therefore salt is good, uh, but even if salt has become tasteless, uh, with what will it be seasoned? And the word seasoned there has to do with condiments. It has to do with food. It has to do with you know, seasoning something to be eaten. Uh, it's the same word that's used in Mark 9, um, which, I, again, the word, there's a, there's a parallel there. Uh, instead of saying, uh, sorry, in Luke 14, where it says um, it's become tasteless, in Mark 9, it says, how will it be made salty again? Um, so it's become unsalty, how it'd be made salty again. So, I mean, I think, I think there's a problem there because I think right off the bat, um, you know, the text is indicating something that is edible. Um, the other problem that I think that you have is uh, in the Matthew, let me just go to the Matthew. 
verse. Um, it says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how will, <coughs> excuse me, how will it be made salty again? Now, the, the Luke passage says that you would use it on the dunghill, right? This says it is good for no. nothing anymore. Right. It's good for, not good for the land or the dunghill. That's what Luke says. It's good for neither now. Right. We haven't explained Except, the dunghill part of it yet. Sorry. Mm. I'll just, Yeah. So you're, you're exactly right. I mixed up the verses. So uh, in, uh, in Luke, ugh, in Luke 14. Yeah. You just go to it. Uh, Therefore, salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, how will it again be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. So right. in Matthew, sorry. And I've just, just so that everybody knows, I've just looked at this like today. Sorry. So forgive me for not being... An expert on this. Uh, but Matthew 5.13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown mm -hmm. out and trampled underfoot by men. So yeah, I guess I guess part of the issue that that I there, there are a couple things. Um, one, we have very clear instances. Um, the book of Job uh, shows salt being used um, as, a, as something to make something salty. We have Sumerian Proverbs uh, that talk about salt being used. Uh, when, uh, how does the proverb go? Um, when you have bread, you don't have salt. When you have salt, you don't have bread. Um, I can't remember it exactly, but I think that's what it is. Uh, so salt is used in the ancient world in this way, right? Now, I think you would agree with me on that. Um, if we have then uh, something here in Luke 14 that says uh, a, a Greek word that's clearly talking about a condiment and something that's meant to um, make something salty as a condiment. I think it's difficult. Um, I think it's difficult to es escape that rendering there. Now, mm -hmm. yeah, let's uh, sorry. Take no. that. Those three things you've thrown out, those are really good points. But um, as for seasoning, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just want to say that that gets us into the dunghill because to this day, organic farmers season their compost that it is called seasoning and this is this goes back to time immemorial the other term you might use it and it was not a term that existed at the time is inoculate so you inoculate a dung pile the same way you inoculate a patch of sourdough a, a batch sorry of sourdough or a batch of yogurt you take some of the previous batch a little bit and put it into the new one to ensure the prop proper bacterial growth. And so that gets us, as I said, I, I said a couple of times we get into the, everyone gets the land part of it, but the part of the dunghill is a little bit harder to understand unless you, you, you do proper composting. You don't just throw your compost out uh, and let it just rot. It can rot the wrong way. So as I say, to this day, organic farmers will inoculate, but the, the other term used was seasoned. Because you are seasoning it, and you're seasoning it literally. If you had a plate of food, you'd sprinkle seasoning on it, salt. Well, if you have a dung pile, and you have some pure saltpeter, guess what? It's like salt. It, it, you, you can put it in a salt shaker and, and shake it over your dung pile, and then you'd, you'd want to mix it in, of course. So just covering off the one of your three points, I just want to make sure people know that that was the term and is still the, the term used seasoning we just think is for food but um i mean when, when they when okay, they so smell steel they'll season it with certain substances yeah, so let's, you know, let's, they use let's, let's talk about that just, just like so that. that we stay point for point here um so can yeah. you find me an example in an ancient text where it uses this greek word to show covering a dung pile and i'm not saying that you can't i'm just saying that would be something that i'd want to look for is so for example you know, saying that we can season something uh, and tie it into inoculate mm -hmm. um, in an English rendering, or you know, that's fine. But in order to make your case strong, and again, I'm not saying that you can't, because I don't know. I haven't done the research on this. Um, I'm just giving you what I get at first blush here. Um, what I would want to see is I would want to see this Greek word as seasoning, which is clearly for condiments uh, in uh, in the text. Um, 
being applied to putting it on a field. That's where you would want to, in my opinion, mm-hmm. that's where you'd want to go with that. Well, it's not where I want to go. It's where Jesus wants to go. I mean, why would he say when the salt loses its flavor, it's no longer good for the land or the dunghill? So he's the one saying, if it still has its flavor, it is good for the land and is good for the dunghill. And I would rest on that and that alone. I'm, I, I have done some etymological research. That's why I knew that the two terms you, you used, the one I remember right now is halal uh, for, for the Greek. And that's the only term they had for salt. For, there, there's actually four varieties of salt we know of in the Bible. Uh, common salt, then the salt for cleansing, which is a lot of people think is uh, uh, the sodium, uh, sodium bicarbonate, which when you mix it with vinegar, effervesces, and that would clean garments. Um, and then saltpeter. The other one, of course, is borax. And, and that was known since ancient times, too. That's now a brand name, but borax is the name of a type of salt. Um, so those are the four types we know existed in the Bible. And they were just all referred to as, whether it's Greek or, or the Hebrew, in the Greek, it's, it's halal. That's the only term they had. But, but to answer your question, yeah, for looking for other examples, well, don't ask me. Ask Jesus or Luke. Well, I, mean, I mean, I think you, what then yeah, did he the thing, I think you'd have to have. Sorry, I think you'd have to have an example. See, what, if, if you have a contentious passage like this um, and you have other Greek texts from the first century, for example, that use this Greek word with respect to condiments going on to food, which is what we have, um, you can't, if, if so, that, that would lead their, uh, leave there a natural reading of this Greek word, right, to season something as far as food is concerned. Um, Mm -hmm. So if you have examples of that coming into this passage, what you would need, and again, I'm not saying that you can't find it. I'm saying this is what I would do. Were I going to write a paper on this and present it, what I would want to do is go back to the Greek sources in particular here um, and find where this word to season um, Mm -hmm. is used in conjunction with land, is used in conjunction with uh, a field or a dung pile. Uh, that would, in other words, then you would have a case to say, here's an example of, even though we have these five or six examples um, in, uh, in ancient Greek writings, talking about this uh, verb uh, referring to condiment usage, it's also a word that can be used to season, as you said, um, a field or a dung pile. That's what I would want to do. That's just, that's just yeah. where but, I would go. But it, now, seasoning... You keep saying condiments. Now, condiments are not seasoning. Seasoning means salt. And by the way, I learned that watching uh, Gordon Ramsay. I mean, he'll, he'll talk about spices and sauces, but seasoning is salt. <laughs> and I don't, don't pretend to have a lot of depth on that. I admit that. I learned that on the Food Channel. And uh, that's what seasoning is. It is salt. And so if we agree that the, the four types of salt were referred to as salt, then we don't have to go and find instances of the term seasoning being used. That is the term they would use as, if, if that was the, the common uh, way to refer to all these salts is just salt. Then I guess they'd think they were seasoning a dung pile. And if they were using borax or sodium uh, bicarbonate to clean clothes, I guess they'd think they were seasoning, seasoning their clothes with it too. But now again, so, yeah. The, and the, this let's, is... say, let's say we point to a, a, a draw on that. Well, then you tell me, what could Jesus possibly have meant when he said, when salt loses its savor, it's no longer good for the land? I mean, I, you can go with the dunghill too. How, there's no case where salt is good for the land or the dunghill. And it's the opposite, even within a biblical context. But all beyond, salt is... Salt is at best neutral and at worst is, is evil. So what, what else could he have meant? Okay, a uh, couple of things. One, we got to be careful um, when we use modern terms and ancient terms. Um, so uh, you can't, unfortunately, what I heard you doing was sort of mixing those, right? And you got to be careful not to do that. Um, for example, there are a lot of legal terms. This happens, in, this happens an awful lot in, in uh, biblical studies. There are legal terms like judgment that have meanings today, and uh, we translate Greek words or Hebrew words as judgment because that's about as close as we can get. But because judgment has very specific meanings in certain contexts in English, we then try to read those specific meanings back into the ancient text. 
So we want to be careful not to do that. Mm -hmm. So if seasoning has that meaning, you can't really read that back into the text. You have to let the text say what it says in its context. And what I'm saying is in this particular case, the instances, and I can send them to you if you like, um, the instances no, let's, let's, show... Let's, let's, uh, let's, if you're right, it's, it's salt. Then what, what the hell is Jesus talking about? That's what I'm asking. Okay, so that, I, that, I that's you. one let's, point. Let's I, just, with that. I want to caution you. Look, here's, here's what I feel like my role is here, right? I don't, I don't know this topic. I don't know it. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm hearing what you're saying. And as a researcher, um, I'm saying to you, sort of what I do is build cases for things from the ancient world. This is what I do. Um, so I'm not here to like lambast you. I'm not here to say that you're wrong. Honestly, in a lot of ways, this isn't like crazy interesting to me. What I'm saying is, I feel like I've been asked here as sort of a, a way to, in a sense, help you, right? Because if, if mm -hmm. you are here trying to, to defend this case, which I think is fantastic, um, then I feel like going through scrutiny is the way that you get to the other side where you've proven your case. So, so um, I forgot what my second point was because I said that. Um, Salt. <laughs> yes. So, um, it's like, nope, I don't remember. Uh, that's like why you think about it. I just have, a, I have, I'm, I'm still, uh, I, me personally, I'm still struggling to understand what the, um, and, and I, and I, I don't mean this, I don't mean this derogatory in any, any way, shape or form. This is just as me, somebody listening to the case, but it, it, so what is, how would you answer that question? Like, so what if Jesus was talking about some other different salt? What does that, what are the ramifications of that? If whether he meant this type of salt or that type of salt, what's the the real world implica you know, implications that this alters something that we need to know about? Uh, you know, otherwise, so what? So how would you answer that? Okay, sure. Well, if you want to go with the standard historical view that salt Peter wasn't known until later, then Jesus is is a truly a prophet. I mean, he's predicting something. If you want to go with the alternative historical, it's currently a, a, an alternative view that Saul Peter was known, as I suggested, as early as the fourth century BC, then he's revealing a secret. And it's a secret held by probably by his people. And in an upcoming article, uh, I, w I, I plan to discuss uh, the, the bringing down of the walls of Jericho. And we all know where the spies spent a few nights. They spent the night, uh, they spent their time with the, the prostitute uh, inside the wall. The walls were so big that people lived inside them. And if anyone knows what a sapper is, uh, we still use sappers in the military today. Uh, sappers would undermine walls or in World War I, they would dig a trench under the enemy's lines and, and pack explosives in there and detonate them uh, and... and uh, that's, that's sort of an underground uh, military warfare. And yeah, I, I, I'm a Christian. I do not believe for a minute that sounding the trumpet on the seventh day brought the walls down. I'm sorry, I've had some arguments with uh, fellow Christians whom I, I love dearly. And they, they really get mad at me when I suggest, no, that the, the Jews... I mean, if the Chinese had saltpeter in the fourth century BC, why didn't wouldn't the Jews have had it maybe in the 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 fifteenth or sixteenth century or whenever? And so, yeah, he's to answer your question, he's either predicting the future or revealing a a military secret. And only Luke nailed it. The other two, maybe they knew what he was doing and they were covering for him. And then, of course, the third John doesn't doesn't even touch it. So you might wonder, well. This is the Sermon on the Mount. It didn't just become famous later. The Sermon on the Mount was probably his, next, next to feeding the multitudes, which he did twice, the Sermon on the Mount is his most important public uh, oration. Why didn't John cover it? And, well, maybe they knew, wow, Jesus is going a little too far here. And those are your two choices. And I don't pretend to know the answer. Uh, but he's either predicting the future or he's revealing a, a closely guarded military secret for which I, I believe there's, there's evidence. Well, there's, uh, so it's not, uh, 
Dr. Bowen, you, um, I know that you're working on things now with, in terms of prophecy and, and that sort of thing. Is there any way to read into these passages as a, a pro, you know, a, a, a cryptic prophecy or a military secret that he's putting out there? Okay. Um, I would say a couple of things about prophecy in, in both the old and new testaments is that they're not terribly shy about it. Um, so for example, when you read through the book of Daniel, uh, particularly get into chapter seven, um, they're just very, very specific, right? Um, this kingdom, this kingdom. Now, it's true that in apocalyptic literature, sometimes they'll just use um, kind of crazy beasts like in Daniel. Um, but let's go to a very specific prophecy. Uh, and actually, I'll be, I'll be talking about this tomorrow night. So it's fresh in my mind. Um, something like Ezekiel 26, right? Ezekiel 26, where um, Ezekiel predicts uh, or prophesies about the fall of Tyre. Right. It's very specific. Um, it names the agent that the Lord will use, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it talks about um, the specific actions that he'll take, uh, the order that it's going to go in, and the ultimate uh, demise of the city. It's going to be scraped clean. The waters are going to come up over it. Um, so they're not, they're not terribly shy, um, generally speaking, about prophecies. Um, now, you, can, you could look at something like Isaiah 53 or Psalm 22, um, where <clears throat> I still think that they're attempting to um, show something with some specificity, and you can see it. For example, Isaiah fifty-three is the fourth servant song, and um, you know this 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 messianic figure um, that represents the nation of Israel is um, you know prophesied to. Uh, bear the, uh, the 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 guilt, you know, be the guilt offering for the the nation of Israel, um, and to bear their sin. Now, the New Testament, when they refer, when the New Testament writers refer back to these prophecies, that can be somewhat more vague, like Psalm twenty two, for example, uh, which is pretty vague. Uh, they will specifically apply them right to a particular instance. What I don't see an awful, I guess what I would want to do, having said all that, again, if I were, if I were writing a paper defending this, what I would want to do is show other examples of ideally Jesus, um, but any of the New Testament authors giving what are clearly prophecies that really um, have no specific prophetic content. And what I mean by that is, you know, Jesus saying you are the salt of the earth, if that's referring to gunpowder um, or something akin to that, I don't know a lot about chemistry. Sorry. Well, um, pro protein. It's referring to protein because without nitrogen something that or explodes. nitrate. Yeah. Well, no, it's, then okay, it's so also it's the key ingredient. In, yeah. When he says salt of the earth, that's protein. When he says salt and light, I'm proposing that's gunpowder. Yeah. So salt of the earth, that still doesn't make sense as salt, but as salt, Peter, yeah, you're the salt of the earth because you're alive and you have muscle tissue and all the protein in your diet and all the protein in your body came from nitrogen. That's what I think he's referring to. Yeah. I mean, I would... I, I guess I would want to find other examples where... Because it, I think that... I think that you would say that that's um, very obtuse, right? That's very, you know, if you if you read, for example, some of um, the prophecies in Revelation, prophecies in Revelation are, it's apocalyptic literature, so I don't want to say strictly prophecy, but, you know, this sort of apocalyptic literature and keep things secret, keep things held, they're very bizarre in some cases, right? But, um you know, they're intending to put forth meaning. And I think it's clear to the reader that even though this symbolism is very strange at times, something that has, you know, seven eyes and seven horns or something, um, it's clearly intending something specific. Uh, whereas I would say that, and so, so then when I, if you come to something like Luke 14 or Matthew 5, 
and you're trying to make that argument, what I would want to see as a, as a, as a, a critical reader, what I would want to see is um, a parallel, something that's parallel, that is clear. Right? We can definitely say that even though this is spoken very mysteriously and you wouldn't pick up on it in any way naturally, um, we clearly see that he's intending something. Authorial intent is very, very difficult to get at. It's very difficult to get at. Um, and so I, I think that's what I'd want to see. Where, where does the, the gunpowder come into to play? Like, how do you get how do you get gunpowder out of that that verse? Well, well, when he says salt and light, but, but first of all, because that's, as I say, that's one metaphor instead of two. Um, mm -hmm. Salt and light, if it's saltpeter, then yeah, it's, it's just one metaphor instead of common salt and light, which are totally unrelated. So uh, how you get that, though, is even before that, you, you, you get that because if this is the type of salt that's good for the land and for the dunghill, then it is also going to be, or perhaps by that time already is, the key ingredient in, in, in an explosive and gunpowder. It is. Uh, so I, I really believe saltpeter was known, that, sorry, gunpowder containing saltpeter was known uh, in, before Christ. And um, I, I keep going with two trains of thought. If someone wants to stick to the sort of uh, the, 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 the conventional theory that no, it wasn't discovered till the, you know, 13th century in China and then made its way to Europe by the 14th century. Fine. Well, well then, then you've got a, you, you've got a top rank profit on your hands there. But in any case, yeah, to answer your question, how you get, how you get gunpowder is, um, if it's good for the land, it ain't salt, it's saltpeter and saltpeter is good for the land. Also the key ingredient in gunpowder. Right, but but my my question is how you get from what it says to it being gunpowder. Like, what is what is the um, e either the phrasing or the terminology used or metaphor? How do you get that he's talk he's talking about specifically gunpowder just by the type of salt that's good for the land and good for the the dung hill? That seems to yeah. be just um, you know right. kind of almost pulled out of nowhere. So how help me along in in how you make that connection? Well, because salt isn't good for the land or the dunghill. It, it would mm -hmm. render it infertile, as we saw throughout the Old Testament. It's a, salt is a sign of infertility, tragedy, and disaster. And so after, after destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, of course, everyone knows Lot's wife turned around to have a, a look, which was forbidden, and she turned into a pillar of salt. So that's not good. But the story of Sodom and Gomorrah continues later in the Bible. Um, it's referred to in a later book. Uh, sorry, I don't know what off the top of my head, but it's the, the reference is, you know, if you, if you keep this up, whatever is going on at the time in this book, uh, it, it, you're going to end up like Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, covered in nettles and stinking salt pits, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in the Old Testament, it's, it's just, it's just bad stuff. And that is, that is undoubtedly salt, but, but if, for it yeah, to be good I, on okay. the land, it, it's, um, well, let's say I grant you that, uh, how do I get to, how do I get to gunpowder though? Like where, where do you get the, the gunpowder out of it? Like what, what's making you think that that's what he's referring to with just with what, with what you just said, none of that equals gunpowder to me. Like, I don't see how you're pulling gunpowder out of that. And, I, and I'm trying mm -hmm. to follow that. Line of thinking. Well, I keep sticking with the first part because it's more important. If it's if it's not salt, then it has to be a different type of salt, which would have been saltpeter, which is the key ingredient mm -hmm. in gunpowder. Otherwise, as I said, you, you just have a match. Like um, a match head is just basically sulfur. It'll ignite and light, but it won't explode. And so sure. nit nitrogen, nitrate is the now. The, but then the next phrase, if you want to leap to it, is where Jesus says. And all four of them get this. All four of the gospel writers get this. They say to be salt and light. And that, if that is two substances, then it's a mixed metaphor, as I said, although I'm not going to, I'm not going to critique Jesus grammar, but it, it so just fits like a glove that it's 
one metaphor, salt and light. Now, now, now by the way, saltpeter on its own is, is in, inflammable. It, it, sorry, it's not flammable. Um, you, need, you, need sul you need the sulfur and the charcoal, and then the saltpeter is the accelerant. It's kind of like putting yeast in dough. Like you'll still have dough without yeast. You just won't rise. So, well, that's what saltpeter does. It's the, it's the oxidizer. That, that accelerates the, 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 the chain reaction. So are you, are you, are you saying that in that, in that verse light is gunpowder? That's what he's referring to. You're, you're saying that the light that he, he uh, mentions there, that's what the gunpowder is because the light is actually yeah. um, like an, some type of explosion or a reaction to um, yeah. okay. literal light that he's not, that it turns out it's not being metaphorical with either that, that's saying, be salt and light. Um, he, he, he literally means to fill yourself with protein, grow crops, feed your kids and carry on. Uh, you're, you're not going to be of any use to anyone. If you starve to death, you're not certainly not going to spread the good news, but then to be okay. salt and light that perhaps you would defend yourself uh, with, with the, uh, the chemical formulation that you keep referring to gunpowder. Gun yeah. That you would, so, you would um, use that. Okay, before we, uh, I'm gonna I'm go to Steve here in just a second for the uh, the chemistry aspect of it. But uh, Dr. Bowen, when is there anything that you take away from that verse when they mention light that um, is is different or how you read into that? Yeah, well, I mean, again, I, I know I, I kind of keep going back to in order to prove the case because um, it's I, I feel like that's useful to to do. Um, so the verse uh, five is it five fourteen, five thirteen, five fourteen, five thirteen um, in Matthew, yeah, and then Luke, it's uh, sorry, verse fourteen, I believe, uh, fourteen. Yeah, yeah, chapter four. You, you, you sorry, right. chapter um, fourteen. But in <laughs> yeah, it's uh, tough to keep all those things straight. I, I hear you. Um, I guess uh, so. In verse in verse fourteen of Matthew chapter five, you are the light of the world. Uh, to Cosmo, and um, a city set on a hill, um, which is actually uh, just just sort of thinking about it here. This is sort of an ancient Near Eastern motif, um, but it follows with uh, you know some some more specificity. No man um, like takes a takes a lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel or a barrel or something. Um, you know, right. but, but I think it's a bushel because I remember the song. The hide it under a bushel. That's no? right. Remember that? Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. Right. Yeah. Right. Don't, this, don't light a was... candle and hide it under a bushel. Yes. And, and that, by the way, is literal light uh, that, that, that's being used in that metaphor. Yeah. But, but certainly not. No, not an explosive variety. You're right. But yeah, it's, it's don't, hide a, don't light a candle and hide it under a bushel. Isn't that it? Yeah. I'm going to let it shine. Yeah. That's so the, I guess... that's the uh, yeah. All right. So. I have so. Uh, if it's, I'll just read them, just so that we can we can kind of see the context. Um, so uh, Matthew five thirteen, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure. I love that. <laughs> but on the lampstand. Uh, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So then it switches. It's like it, it, it clearly makes it. A, a, in my opinion, I would have to see evidence that this is not a metaphor. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. That's mm -hmm. these sort of you are and I am motifs that show up in the Gospels in particular. Um, are almost exclusively metaphorical. Um, and so I, what I would want to see, and, and this, is what I would, this is what I would shoot for, is trying to find um, places where um, what, what appear to be metaphorical are clearly not metaphorical. These are literal statements. Um, I think these are things yeah. that you'd have to contend with here in this passage. Yeah, and that, that takes us to Luke. See, I, I just think Matthew got it wrong or didn't understand fully. I think John did.
did understand, which is why he didn't even go near it. And Mark, for his part, uh, doesn't discuss, um, he, he sort of touches upon it, but not as much as Matthew and Luke. But yeah, you're right. I, I think Matthew, I think there's evidence that he didn't get it. A lot of Christians are mad at me for suggesting, because remember, the gospels are supposed to be breathed out by God. Matthew just held the pen in his hand. He just happened to be the guy who was there to, to uh, uh, record God's word. I think he didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Luke did. Luke, there, there's no way salt is good for the land. And that's uh, part of the article. I, I, I cover how many people have tried to explain this. And they're non-farmers, by the way. And, and they say, well, in ancient times, they used to put salt on a dunghill to, like you said, to season it. No, they didn't. They never did. No one's ever done that. Um, and by the way, and then you get uh, towering uh, theologians, tow towering pastors like, like Francis Chan, wh whom I really respect. And he literally thinks it's salt. And he, in, his, in his sermon on it, he pours salt onto a Bible, you know, I guess sort of thinking that you'll preserve the word. That's the metaphor. And then when it gets to the dung hill, he's saying, you're the dung hill, you and all of us, because we're worthless. And unless we get this right, we're just going to rot away like manure. And no, that, that's, not to, on the, that's not what Jesus is saying at all. He's saying when salt loses its flavor, it's no longer good for the dunghill. Um, on that note, also you have to come back to losing its flavor. Remember, salt doesn't lose its flavor. That's why it's used as a metaphor for the covenant of salt that we hear in the Old Testament. Salt does not lose its... There's salt that's been around for... Well, however long you think the earth is old, there's salt that's been around that long. Nitrogen disappears. It returns to the earth's atmosphere. Nitrogen has a liquid, solid, and gaseous state on, on the earth's surface. So it's trapped in the, the roots of legumes like peas and, and, and soy. Um, it's trapped through mechanical means in, in, uh, in synthetic ammonium nitrate fertilizer. Um, and it's also available in liquid form as a and as an explosive powder and, and liquid. Um, and then the, the most nitrogen you're ever going to find and could ever have found all throughout history is in the Earth's atmosphere. So there's the metaphor. How does salt lose its flavor? It doesn't. Saltpeter loses its flavor. It all returns from whence it came. All we're doing with farming is capturing nitrogen, which gives protein to food without which you don't have food. And we capture it temporarily in our livestock and in our bodies. And then it all goes back. It, goes, it loses its flavor. And if you have a, a compost pile and you leave it for too long, some people think the longer you leave it, the better. No, no, no. Um, you're, you're looking at maybe 120, 130 days if you're turning it properly, as you should. And if you inoculated it with a previous compost pile. Um, and then after that, it, the nitrogen level starts to nosedive and when you get to a year some people for some reason have this stuck in their head that a, a year old manure is really good for your garden well yeah it's going to be good soil when it's a year old but it's not going to be a fertilizer it's not going to have any nitrogen left in it at all most of it will have leached out into the ground below and gone uh through the waterway uh into the nearest stream and river um and some of it has evaporated sooner or later all of it evaporates and that's how the metaphor sticks for, for uh, Luke and Matthew, really. Because remember, Matthew says, if salt loses its flavor. Uh, by the way, then, when you do have a compost pile and it's lost its, nit it's lost its flavor, it's just dirt now. Well, what do you do? This brings us back to Matthew. It can be cast under men's feet. They would just use it for the streets of a town. They would just, uh, you know, it's better than walking on sand, I guess. They'd throw, some, they'd throw this useless... Uh, over composted compost down on the streets and to be trodden under men's feet. So, um, Steve, I know you wanted to ask some questions about the, um, the, the chemistry aspect of it. It seems to all, uh, go back to shit eventually. It's part of my French, but, um, it's, it's, it's hinging on the dung, the dung pile, right? Yeah. That's a, that's a crude way to say it. That's, but, uh, that's a, yeah. Why would Jesus go there? Like some people are so confused by that. Yeah. Why would he mention dung? That's not holy and spiritual, but 
That's where it all yeah. goes. You're absolutely it's right. Kind of shitty. And then you then it's you start the cycle over again. Yep. Go ahead, Steve. Yep. Yeah, maybe we can walk it back a little bit because I I'm in the same boat here as a lot of people that are actually listening in, and I'm going to go back in my my chemistry days because it was not an area that I excelled in, although I did take basic chemistry. So hopefully we can maybe help people out, kind of suss out your argument because I'm really kind of confused here. So maybe you can help me out. So a salt is basically just a, a, what you get when you mix an acid with a base, right? They neutralize each other and you're left with a salt. So anything that you have a, 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 that kind of equation, you're going to have some kind of salt. So potassium nitrate is literally just a, a potassium mixed with Na, a nitrogen, NO3, right? So you have an a anion and a, a cation. They, mix, they come together, you have a salt. People in the live chat that know chemistry, please help me out here because like I said, this is not my area. But not always do you have, I mean, you're talking about like potassium nitrate and gunpowder, which was, as far as I know, the Chinese discovered around a thousand something AD or something, right? Yeah. And potassium mm -hmm. nitrate is not like only thing used in matches. You can actually use like what's called potassium chlorate, which is very easy to make with potassium chlorate and bleach. I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but I do know. Um, but your, 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 your argument is that Jesus is, is basically telling people about chemistry before they even know knew what a salt was what the chemistry was um is is that kind of what the argument is that they knew what a, that when they were referring to salt like when they say the salt of the earth mm -hmm. when you salt the earth as far as i remember that basically meant to destroy the land right because if you salt the land nothing's going to grow there. yeah if, if you had potassium yeah. nitrate that acts as a fertilizer right because there's nitrogen and that would actually benefit the land so yeah i'm trying to distinguish between when you're saying there's salt in the earth or somehow it is either destroying the land or helping the land or helping the dung. Can you kind of help us out try to kind of understand where we're going with that? Cause I think I'm in the same position as everybody else. I'm just confused and I really want to understand this. Well, again, now, now we get, was Jesus predicting something, as you said, uh, China in a thousand AD, some, by the way, the, the, the common, uh, the convention, if you will, is like uh, 14th century or sorry, 13th century maybe in China, and then a century later, a century and a half later, it made its way to Europe. Now, you, you can go with that, and I believe everything in my argument sticks. So I, I don't even get into this in the article. Um, but remember, what I'm suggesting is that he wasn't predicting something, he was revealing something. And you know, you, you said something very key there. You said, you know, this is very easy chemistry. And that's the argument made by some Muslim scholars. He said, why wouldn't they know? If they knew how to start a fire, if they knew how to smelt different types of metals and combine copper with, you know, I don't know my metallurgy, but basically to get bronze as opposed to softer metals. So bronze created empires because they could beat their enemies. Um, if they could do that, why, why wouldn't they understand the fundamental, like you said, it's basic chemistry. Why wouldn't they understand that? And the only question then becomes, well, wouldn't they keep it a secret? Wouldn't the powerful keep it a secret? And of course they would. And so you got the, you know, the, the Jews walking around the promised land with their, their Ark of the Covenant. And some people have, have uh, we're really getting out there now, but really stick with me for a second. A lot of people hypothesize, well, there was something, and maybe they had uranium in there. You know, it was, it was, it was radioactive because there's a story about some guy coming up and touching it and he dropped dead. Well, who knows? Maybe someone stabbed him in the back. You're That's probably a logical explanation. Well, you're, you're not, you're not going to drop uranium. Like uranium. I, I worked around right, uranium. Not right around away. Yeah. 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 Well, well, actually, it's it's not all uh, well uh, yellow cake is, is harmless to, to hold. You can hold it indefinitely. It's it's an alpha, uh, yeah. it's a beta emitter, so it's it's not going to really do anything to you. Sure. You don't want to eat it, but uh, yeah, it's, I, it's harmless. I, I don't buy into that theory that the, the Jews had nuclear technology, but, but this is, you know, people wonder what was in the Ark of the Covenant? Why was it brought to the walls of Jericho? Why was it trotted around the city was the, as the Israelites marched around the city and sounded the trumpet on the seventh day? Well, it, it contained saltpeter. This was their military secret. This is how uh, a small band of a, what, you know, a, a million or two million people ended up becoming the richest empire in the world under King David and then his son Solomon. They, they, were, they were it. They were, they were, the, uh, they were, uh, they were the Washington, D.C. empire of their day. And I think what happened is they, they decided, you know, it's too much work. The, the Romans figured this out too. It's too much work to rule over people. 
So let's just, you know, play both sides against the middle. And that's indeed what the, the, the Jews ended up doing throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance is um, they had supply lines through the East India Company, both the, the Dutch East India and the English East, East India Companies, which ended up merging when they, they were all controlled by the, the Jews out of Amsterdam. Um, and, and they used the slave labor in India and, and to a certain extent in China to, uh, to sell saltpeter to both sides in any war all the way up to and including the Second World War. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the, the history that we're dealing with. But, but going back to, to what you asked, how do, how do we get, we don't get gunpowder, we get the key ingredient in gunpowder. And how do we get that again? Yes, I, I should look into other references. It couldn't hurt. But how do we get that? It's, it can't be salt when Jesus says, when salt loses its favor, it's no longer good for the land. It can't be salt. And there, there is one other thing that is good for the land. There, there, there's one other one that's neutral. That, that would be sodium bicarbonate, which comes out of the Nile, as we mentioned. Um, and that was used as a cleansing agent in the Bible. And it was called nitre. And that's ironically where we get the modern term nitrogen. But no, Jesus wouldn't say that. Put something neutral on your land. No, no. He's, as, as you alluded to, he's referring to something that is good for the land until when until it loses its savor and then it's no longer good for the land and, and we know that that's again as you said that's that basic chemistry it's and by the it's way i just, just want to correct because I, I i misspoke um you any to the day is actually an alpha emitter i mean yeah not a beta emitter so i misspoke then i want to correct myself because somebody with the nuclear field should know that so you ran to the eight actually oh, yeah. alpha decays into thorium so i like to be correct in that kind of stuff so if nobody sure. noticed but i did and i went wait a minute so I had to correct yeah was that all you had so to i I, th I think that was, yep. i think that was the secret that the jews held and i think uh jesus revealed part of it do, do you think they used gunpowder for like the wall of jericho like you mentioned sappers which was if I correct me if i'm wrong was like the british yeah. troops they would dig yeah. underground and then they would basically yeah. unstabilize the wall and the wall would fall right yeah, yeah, no, no, here's the thing. Okay. If you send sappers underground, these are not your slaves. These are not your cannon fodder. These are these skilled. Are it, it, yeah. These are troops, and they are not, they're not your cannon fodder. Uh, the, the, the modern term, there's many modern terms. Navy SEALs, uh, frogmen in the British Navy. I mean, these are your mm -hmm. elite. Your sappers are your elite. Indeed, who does Joshua send? the spies he sends in and, and they, they hang out with uh, what's her name? Rahab, the, the prostitute, the Canaanite prostitute inside the wall. Now, what are they doing? Just reporting back. Oh yeah. The Canaanites have uh, this many men and they're the, remember they're big. Well, they already know all that. What are these spies doing inside the wall? Well, they're sapping. Now here's the key. If you just undermine a wall and keep digging until it collapses, what happens to your sappers? They die. They die? Trapped underground. Yeah. You can, how do you get out of there? The only way to have effective sappers is to dig the, the hole and plant explosives and get the hell out of there and then light the fuse. If you just keep digging and you're under a castle wall, and you just, yeah, it's eventually going to collapse. It's going to collapse on top of you, and you're, you're never going to be seen from again. W what man in his right mind would want to become a sapper? So they had to have some mechanism. Now, some people have suggested for early forms of sap, let, let, let's go to the medieval period to bring down a castle wall. You would, you would dig a tunnel under the castle wall and then put beams in and then pull the beams out from a safe distance back down the tunnel. Well, still, while you're digging, you're at great risk of this thing just collapsing on you. Who's going to do that? Well, it's dead easy if you have explosives. You just need to be under the wall. It doesn't have to be a big chamber you've carved out. Just big enough for one man to pack explosives in there and then back out with the fuse. And that's how you bring down the walls of Jericho. Uh, it would have been easier Dr. to use a claymore or C4, Bowen, do you want to speak? Do you want to speak to um, Jericho? Anything you want to add there? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Her house was on top of the wall, um, which was you know common enough in the time. So I think it was again, inside, inside. Clear. She she's inside the wall. 
But but yeah, okay. they're what what well, are these spies uh, doing there? Sorry to interrupt. All right, hold on. Um so then she let them down by a rope, this is Joshua two fifteen, through the window for her house yeah. was on the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. Um well, she lets them out a window, so she's in the wall, not on, not on top. No, her, her but even on top, is, these, these guys are there. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So I've I've always wondered what the spies did. The the hold, lesson. Hold on, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Joshua. Um, Misha, hold on one second. Yeah. Um, was that? Were you finished with your thought, Doctor Bowen? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm good. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Misha. Well, okay. So the lesson of Joshua, if you read it superficially, and as you'll hear it in Sunday school, and as you'll hear it in any sermon, is to believe in God, to listen to Him. Don't doubt Him, because jo Joshua sent spies in, and the spies came back and said, "Man, those Canaanites are big." They're going to rip us up. But Joshua says, no. Uh, well, first he says, I'm going to go away and pray. And he comes back and says, no, we're doing this. God says, we're doing this. And remember, Joshua had a vision. He meets, a lot of people say it's Jesus. He meets Jesus. And Jesus says, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. So this is what Joshua reports back. Kind of like when Moses had reported back to his people that, that he had seen the divine, the deity. So he goes back and says, we're going in. We got to listen to God. Tell me, why do you send spies in if God's got your back? Why do you send spies? That's doubting God. That's double checking God. The spies were the sappers and they were part of the plan right from the start. They knew that however they could contend with the Canaanites on a man to man basis in, in battle, nothing was going to happen until the walls came down. Now, now, by the way, the, the city, the, the circumference of the walls is like, I don't know, it's like a mile or more around. When we say the walls came down, a lot of people think, whoa, the wall, the, all the walls collapsed. No, it's a double wall, as in most cities that had walls. You don't just build one wall, you build, it's a double wall. By the way, people lived in the wall. There were guards working in the wall. It's a double wall. So when they breached the wall, that might only have been, you know, 25 yards, 50 yards wide. And that fits the text. The walls, plural, came tumbling down. No, not the walls surrounding the entire city. You don't need to do that. You just need to breach the wall. And since there were two walls, the, the, the text fits. It's uh, the walls came tumbling down. Does the, does the text fit that neatly, Dr. Bowen? Um, yeah, I'm actually just kind of looking through, um, so, I mean, sorry, I'm just looking through some of the Hebrew. Um, fun. it definitely uses, sorry, it definitely uses a bait. So, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to say it, it could mean in, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just, I don't know if it's just me. It may be just me, but I don't – with whatever salt that he's, he's talking about using, or maybe it's – you know, maybe it is the gunpowder um, thing. What – how does this affect things? Like what does this change from, um, you know, a, either a Christian's perspective? How does it alter your faith if you're – if you've, you know, believed yeah. it to mean that you're the actual salt of the, the earth? Like what are the – ramifications for the change that, that you see in this text? Like, how is that going to affect yeah. everybody's day-to-day, -day, knowing that it means something different than what they thought before? Well, the, the common assumption is that to be a good Christian, you're basically a pacifist. Um, so, you know, turn the other cheek. But as I remind uh, my kids, you only have two cheeks. Jesus doesn't say just to keep letting someone slap you. And by the way, if someone slaps your face when he refers to that, that's sort of a metaphor for, you know, if it's, a, if it's an insult, you know, you don't have to get into a big fight over it. If someone slaps your face, that's like calling you a name. Just turn the other cheek. Say, yeah, so what? So what if I'm ugly? 
Can't you do better than that? You know, <laughs> and then same when he says to carry a Roman centurion's armor for him, he says the law of the day was if, if you met a Roman centurion walking the same way as you on a road, he could make you carry his armor, which was quite heavy for one mile. Well, Jesus says, carry it too. He doesn't say carry it three or four or five. So the, the limit here, the limit that I think a lot of people forget, and yet we, we trot off to war all the time and, and kill people, which is breaking the commandments. Um, the, the limit is at self-defense. I think that's what Jesus is referring to. And then the other chapter from Luke that buttresses this is where he tells his disciples the night before he dies, he says, how many swords do we have? And this again is in, I think it's in Matthew and Luke, but Luke, Luke goes further with it. How many swords do we have? And he says, any of you that don't have a sword, take your scrip and your garment and sell it and get one. Now elsewhere it says he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. But living by the sword is being like a mercenary. You're living by your sword. But if you're just a common Joe, if you're a, you know, a doctor like Luke was or a tax collector like Matthew was and, and you carry a sword, well, you're not living by the sword. That's self-defense. And the night before Jesus dies, he knows he's dying, but he doesn't want any of his disciples to, to die because then it's the whole thing's over. The whole thing was for no reason. And he, so he tells them quite clearly, if you don't have a sword, <laughs> now would be a good time to get one. And people have grappled with this. I've read so much on it and have argued with some people. They say, it's not a sword. Look at the translation. It's a knife. Okay, well, why does Jesus tell them to go get a knife? Why? So they can carve fruit while they're out spreading the good news? It's a sword, and we know that because then the following night, uh, Peter tries to, well, he does, he cuts a guard's ear off, which you can't do with a knife. You could do that with a sword, though, if you swipe it. And Jesus glues the guard's ear back on, and that's when he rebukes him and says, don't do that. He, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Because in that moment, Peter is trying to live by the sword, or more accurately, help Jesus live by the sword. Of course, Jesus knows he's going to die, but more to the point, um, that's not Peter's role at that point. The, the, so the reason saying, Peter uh, needed a sword and Jesus had told him to get one was for, for later. You're saying Jesus I, is pretty instructing sure people to, to, to go out and be I'm pretty, offensive. I'm pretty, Wait one second. I'm pretty sure you can cut somebody's ear off with a knife. I'm pretty sure that's a fact. Yeah, you, yeah. You'd have to grab it, though, right? You'd have to grab the ear and, Not and then... Not necessarily. Depends on the knife, I guess. Well, nice. yeah. but is that what you're saying? That, that Jesus is instructing people uh, instead of to instead of just being defensive to... Or no, be, to be pacifist. Defensive, you're, 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 but yeah, right. You're saying that instead yeah. of being a pacifist, though, he's instructing... Yeah. These are ways that he's instructing people to be... Uh, to fight back if provoked. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're going to be out spreading the word. We know Peter was attacked many times. He was attacked for spreading the word, but he was also just attacked. I mean, the disciples, they're out, they're out in no man's land, you know, and there's uh, highwaymen and vagabonds and all sorts of ne'er-do-wells. And yeah, yeah Jesus knows so, it's going to be rough. And, and, and he knows they're going to face reprisals from the Jewish community. But but yeah, again, he just knows it's it's not going to be pretty out there, and they should defend so, themselves. So here's my question: if if that's true, why does he use for for where people get the the passive um, answer? They get it out of you know turn the other cheek. Um, you know, uh, yeah. it, it, this should be an eye for an eye. It's very clear, and you're able to take that t that takeaway is very evident from when he says turn the other cheek that means you know don't f don't fight back don't you know do why would he use such um i mean that saying the salt of the earth that that uh, verse it's very hard to parse out that he's telling you to be defensive not not passive so where he's very clear and it's very simple in one the other one takes some sussing out if if we are to you know go with with your interpretation of it. Why wouldn't he just be clear in um, you know if if someone uh, messes with you, you mess back? Like it, it seems too much of a there's there's too many hoops to jump through to get the defensive line out of that. Just reading it offhand. 
Yeah, I would agree that it's not, nothing is straightforward. It's, that's why we have four gospel writers, for instance, you know, to, to get it straight. So for the, the people who've, who've um, criticized me for daring to suggest, as I said, that Matthew didn't quite get it right, even though he's my favorite gospel writer of the four, um, for, the, for those people, I said, well, then if, if God just breathed it out perfectly, why do we have four gospels? And actually we have five or six, you know, you, you start counting Paul's writings and Peter's and James. And why do we have all that? Why, I mean, you could lay out the Christian doctrine on one page of full scap, couldn't you? And even if you wanted to complicate it with things that I'm throwing in, okay, two or three pages, 10 maybe, but we don't, we got a whole new Testament and pretty clear from Jesus and Paul we're not supposed to throw out the old one either. It's one contiguous Bible. So, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Nothing is just clear cut. Hey, hey, Christians, defend yourselves. Don't take crap from anybody. You know, yeah, turn the other cheek. What? Don't needlessly engage Why? in battles. But when it, when it, when Why can't it be that shove, simple, though, Misha? Yeah, you're... Why can't it be that oh, simple? I, I, yeah, I don't, it seems I don't, like, I don't know that, like that'd be the yeah, way to go. That's a great you know? question. You want everybody on the yeah. same page, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, having to now, go through, through piles of shit and dung yeah. and all that stuff to, to, to figure out that he's telling you to um, fight back when provoked. Uh, I, I just think is, is there's just too many hoops that you have to jump through to get there. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like it, mm -hmm. it seems like that, that you, yeah, you can, you can contort it enough to make it seem like it's saying that, but on its face, it's like, it's, you wouldn't get that out of it. Like you, you, or maybe one of the few people that would come to that conclusion just reading that, because that's a lot of connections to come to that conclusion. Uh, have you gotten any kind of like, what's the feedback been from fellow Christians or pe other people that you've kind of presented this to? What like what pastors and things like that? What do they say about what you put forth well, here? The the best feedback was from the editor of Culture Wars, Doctor E. Michael Jones, who's a a Catholic. He's got many books under his belt and he saw fit to publish it. So that was the, that plus my wife who proofreads everything and has actually, actually quashed a few articles. I, I used to write on all sorts of things, secular issues, farming, and she's changed sentences and paragraphs. And as I said, even quashed a few articles that were perhaps inappropriate, but yeah, Dr. E. Michael Jones uh, went with it. And uh, so that was pretty good. Beyond that, I have to say, um, I've, I've received a lot of ambivalent or neutral feedback and most of it is negative. Most of it is indeed negative that no, you're, you're crazy. There's no way, but can I just add one thing? You're, you're wondering why is it so convoluted? I don't know why there are 66 books in the Bible written over 1500 years. I don't know. You tell me, but can I say this, that for as convoluted as it is, the new Testament is way more straightforward than the old. And I think the reason the Old Testament is more convoluted is because there's more cover-up going on. So frankly, as, as I'll discuss in a later article, um, there, there's a guy with my name, King Misha. And his job was to give 100,000 rams and the wool from some 10,000 sheep to the Jewish kings every year to keep them off his back. And the way the story goes, he got fed up with paying them this annual tribute, which is basically a tax, you know, maybe it's interest on a loan, call it what, what, whatever you want, usury. Um, he gets, King Misha gets tired. This is in the, the book of Kings, I believe. Um, he gets tired of this and he stands up to them. And so the Jews say, well, we got to go straighten them out. And they, and they go to invade his kingdom. And, and when they come to his kingdom, they see he's standing on the wall of his city and he murders his own son and then burns him on the wall. And this so frightened the Jews that they turned around and, and went back. Well, there's this thing called the Moabite stone, which was discovered in the 1800s. And no one denies its uh, veracity. And it shows that, no, what King Misha did is he went to a neighboring kingdom that was allied with the Jews, that wasn't paying them this, this, this horrible tribute. And he, he sacked them. He knocked the stuffing out of them. And that was why the Jews turned around and hightailed it. And they decided, let's just leave this King Misha alone. Well, well, first of all, good for him. But second of all, 
doesn't that fit better? The Moabite stone discovered 18, well, 2,500 years later from when that book was written. Uh, see, the Jews are covering up when they, when they write that he murdered his own son and cremated him on the wall of a city, which is really difficult to do, by the way. I mean, cremating a body, there's going to be a lot of wind up there on the wall, but that's, that's beside the point. No, he didn't murder his own son. He murdered your ally in the area and proved his mettle. And you guys subsequently so left it, him alone. So that's a cover not up. true stories that's in the Bible. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How do you, yeah. Well, how, well, yeah. how do you know the Moabite stone, which is a historical thing? I mean, they did discover that. How do you know it's not allegorical? And by the way, I like your version of Jesus better. I think that, you know, I'll turn the other cheek a couple of times, but if you keep messing with me, I'm going to cut you like a bitch. I, well, I think I like that version. Yeah. Better. <laughs> let me let me ask let me yeah. start the ball oh, this well, before you before you yeah. answer that. Hold on, uh, sure. hold on one second, Misha. Um, with yeah. the story of yeah, sure. uh, since this is right up your alley, um, Doctor Bowen, do you have anything you can shed light on the um, the Moabite situation where uh, he talks about burning his son on the uh, on the wall? Yeah, I mean, so I've translated Misha inscription, but so I guess what I would say when you come to royal inscriptions or inscriptions of any kind like that. Take. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, Please say take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> Very nice. Um, <laughs> that was very quick. That was very quick. Thank no, you. I, you know, ancient texts do things. And I think, I think we need to realize that. Um, it's very important in this discussion. So, um, I think one of the things that bothers me about this is that um, this idea that that these stories are convoluted or that the biblical text is convoluted. Actually, it's not, in my opinion. Um, I feel like I have some I feel like I have some standing to to comment on it. Um, it's actually very um, logical uh, the way the texts are put together. Now, the, the problem, of course, is that. Um, many of the genres that are used in biblical text, particularly in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, are not genres that we have today, right? So, um, you know, reading through something like Genesis 1, 2, you know, we don't have a cosmological genre today, so that stuff doesn't make sense to us. So we read through the Psalms and we say, sure, we have, we have poetry, so that stuff makes sense. Um, royal inscriptions are something that you know, my wife deals with ad nauseum. Uh, she's writing her dissertation on it, and... You know, you have to be able to mine uh, those texts um, in a way that is productive. But I, I think that coming back into this New Testament text and, and, and trying to make this argument that, um, and I'm getting a little more pointed now, um, I, think, I think there's a principle that we have to go with um, in ancient texts or in modern texts, really in probably just in, in general principle, uh, things that are clear, um, if the text is clear in a particular place about a particular topic, um, and another text has to be, I mean, let's just say it, interpreted in a way that is very much against the grain, um, then, then we need to question, I think, pretty seriously, uh, interpreting that text against the grain. So when I read, for example, from Matthew 5.38, the passage that we've been quoting sort of um, piecemeal, uh, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist him who is evil, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. And whoever shall force you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the son, uh, his son to, raise, uh, to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what more do you do than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You know, that text is very clear. 
Now, I'm not saying that I agree that uh, that Jesus spoke those words. Um, that's not what I'm saying. But stepping into that into that worldview and understanding the text as being the inspired word of God, that's very clear. Um, and it bears out right when you look at um, the way that the disciples lived and died. Uh, they do so in a way that is um, not fighting back. Right. I mean, that's the I think that's the. That's the point of the text. Uh, when they're when they're persecuted, uh, when they're jailed, when they're imprisoned, um, they pray and they sing hymns. You know, they're not scheming of ways of fighting fighting back. So I guess what I would say is, given the clarity that we have in these passages, uh, both in the in the in the <coughs> excuse me in the descriptions of the way uh, a disciple is to behave, and then watching them behave in just that manner, understanding that text. Um, understanding a, a text that doesn't seem to have any bearing on this uh, and piecing it together in order to make it say just the opposite. I think, well, I, just, I just think it's a difficult thing to do. What do you say? Yeah, that, not, not the opposite point. though. Yeah. Not, not the opposite. No good God. That's, that's what people have been doing. <laughs> Look at all the people who died in all the wars and look at all the people we've murdered. No, not the opposite. Not the opposite. To, to say, to take that text and say, yeah, don't needlessly engage in any kind of violence. But, I mean, who would deny the right to self-defense? I mean, sure, it's written in the Constitution, but it's kind of a, it's a, a pre-existing fundamental right. No one has the right to harm you or your family or invade your home. Um, and, and by well, the way, that is clear. The Bible. We, we have, I don't, we I don't have think that's property. what he's, we have. Yeah, that's not what he's saying. That, like, because you brought up just a second ago that he's that Jesus is using the salt example as a means to kind of um, encourage people to be defensive, right? And Dr. Bowen just read a, yeah, a verse that says the opposite. He's saying, you know, if if someone in, wants your coat, or, note, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. well, it's, it's in this passage. Yeah. And so it's in, yeah. the passage that we're talking about with salt yeah. well, is Matthew. Okay, okay. Well, even, 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 even 20 verses even later in Matthew hold 5. On. He, hold on one second, Misha. Um, let, me, let me just get this out so everybody can understand. Um, it's it's giving you examples of if uh, if you know turn the other cheek if if, if you sue them for the, your or if you get sued for your shirt to give them your coat. I mean that's that's the complete opposite of defensive. That's being um, you know overly. I guess the word would be submissive or or something like that. Like you're 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 no, offering no, more no, for them not, to. No, it's being the term you're looking it's, it's for is passive. diplomatic. It's being diplomatic. There's it's being it, why why destroy your life and someone else's because they sued you or, and you know and you're going to give them sure, your cloak yeah. or your shirt. Yeah, so, it's so being the, diplomatic. So the, point, so the point is, the point is though, it if he's telling you this specifically, like he's saying this is how you're supposed to be mm -hmm. specifically, which is opposite of what you're saying in terms of being defensive. Like he's not telling them to be defensive at all. I, I mean, I don't get that out of that. Do you, Steve hey. or, or or Josh? I get a completely opposite of defensive, just to walk away almost, or um, you know, uh, don't engage back. But so, and if that's how they live that's their the life out, how, how do yeah. you, how do you kind of still come to that conclusion? Well, because Jesus said you will suffer, but he didn't say you should. See, a lot of people go out now, now in, in uh, medieval times, we had the flagellists and those guys make themselves suffer. They would whip their own backs to be more close to what Jesus felt. You don't suffer, you shouldn't suffering. You should avoid suffering. You will suffer. The world will make you suffer if you're a good Christian. But you don't, there, there's, no, there's no honor. You don't get into heaven because you suffered. You just, it's a warning. Now, now you, you guys explain this. You're absolutely right. I mean, it, not all of the Bible is 100% consistent, certainly not throughout the New Testament. Then what did Jesus mean when he said, take your cloak, the same cloak you're supposed to give away if you're sued, and sell it and buy a sword? What's he talking about? I think he's bipolar. Okay, so, I can't so get let's, around that. Yeah, so let's, yeah, so let's, let's deal with that um, because I don't think there's a good answer, right? Um, I think there is. It's called self-defense. 
Okay. We, um, we, we got, so perfect. let me just, let me just continue if I could. Um, so there's a reason that uh, articles are written, uh, scholarly articles are written on, I, I, I actually read one before we started here on that, that particular passage because um, it is difficult, right? Um, and I think it would be silly to say uh, that trying to, trying to, uh, this is the problem that I think uh, that, that you're going to have to wrestle with here. And it seems like what you're doing. Um, I feel like you're kind of wishing away in a sense what these, uh, something like Matthew chapter five is clearly saying, um, or something like Matthew 18, uh, and where Peter says, how many times should I forgive my, uh, my brother for wronging me? Seven times? And he says, no, I tell you 70 times seven. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think that the div and it's not just, it's not just being diplomatic in Matthew five. Um, he, you know, this is persecution uh, that's being described. I mean, it's, it's what it says, it's persecution. It's uh, don't be afraid to loan people money that aren't going to pay you back. That's not diplomacy. Uh, mm -hmm. it's being used. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. But of course, this, this plays out, right? Uh, you know, Paul says the, the same thing in first Corinthians. Um, you know, don't, don't go suing people. And the point uh, mm -hmm. I think is, is that, tumultuous times are coming, right? And um, how does one, uh, how does one in these tumultuous times, I mean, this, this is, sorry, but this is apocalyptic genre, right? This is, you're going to go through hellish times. That's the point. You're mm -hmm. gonna go through these hellish times. Mm -hmm. You're gonna suffer. You're probably gonna die. Many of you are gonna die, but there's hope, right? Because this is the messianic, this is the messianic, just the apocalyptic genre that hell is coming here on earth. But if you can, in fact, those that die inside that apocalyptic time, right, this, this time of great tribulation, those that suffer and die are the ones that are going to be honored the most. I mean, this is the apocalyptic genre. So I think trying to, trying to from, I want to say from logic, but from 21st century logic of how we, how we interact in, in our legal system, to try to say, well, that must, that must be there in the first century. I think is to, um, to, to put something back on the text in spite of what the text is saying. Now, I will say, and I'll stop with this, but I will say that, um, that uh, Jesus' statement uh, about uh, buying a sword um, is difficult. Yeah. I think there are a couple of things that we have to um, take into consideration. And uh, again, I don't think this gives us an answer, uh, but they, they have two swords and he says it's enough. Right. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Peter, that, Peter draws the sword and, and goes to do this attack. And just, what, you know, what are you doing? So, I mean, um, I think that the reason that so many articles have been written on this is because it's so difficult. Right. And the reason it's so difficult is because Luke is so unbelievably clear. Matthew is so unbelievably clear about this. Um, uh, I don't want to say pacifistic, but yeah, I mean, that's that's what it is. Um, uh don't it, fight back. But you're, you're confusing the two. Yes, you're right. Elsewhere, he said, how many swords do we have? And what do they say? We have one. And he goes, that's enough. And what he's saying in the other passage we're discussing, he says, whoever doesn't have a sword, go get one. Not difficult for self-defense, because what, what good is a disciple if he's dead? And why didn't they do it? Now, maybe that's my question. Why didn't they do it? Yeah, why didn't they do it? Well, how do we know they didn't? No one wrote about what... All we know is they all died, and they all died horribly except for John. We have no idea who they met with, who they spoke with, how many people they converted except for Paul. We know the churches he established. We don't know anything about any of okay, them. Okay, so let's take the Acts of the Apostles. They all, let's they just all take died. the Book of Acts. Hold on one second, Sorry, I feel like I'm... Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Josh. Sorry, I'm getting a little... So we have the Acts of the Apostles, which is exactly what this describes, right? Um, this describes the apostles going out, uh, mm -hmm. being persecuted, right? The Apostle Paul is one that's doing it. Saul of Tarsus is doing the, the persecuting. He gets converted um, and ultimately goes to his own death. I, so, I mean... <sighs> I don't see the apostles fighting back. As a matter of fact, I see just the opposite. Um, I see them undergoing this persecution, but continuing because this is what apocalyptic genre calls for. Mm -hmm. I, I would disagree. You're right. We say 
you say you don't see them fighting back, you don't see them doing anything. The, the, we have no idea <laughs> what do. any of them did <laughs> except for do. Paul. That's what the Book of Acts is. Okay. Well, that's no. The Book of Acts is them getting ready. That's that's the that's the huddle. <laughs> that's them get to get out there, wait for the Holy Spirit, and there they're all endowed. They have the flame over, this, and they speak in different tongues, and they spread out, and that's the last we hear of most of them. Negative. Those are the first two chapters of the Book of Acts. There's 28 chapters in the Book of Acts that you're describing. Mm -hmm. Acts one eight through chapter two. Um, mm -hmm. But, but well, no, who the about rest in the, of the book of Acts of, is the Acts of the Apostles. Right, and we start hearing new characters like Timothy and Barabbas. We don't hear what Matthew and, and well, we only one we hear of is John who in the Isle of Patmos. We don't hear what any of them did, any of the 12 or 11. Okay, I'm, I'm going to encourage you to read we, we Acts. Don't. I would encourage you to read the book of Acts. <laughs> who, who do we hear about? Who, who do we hear about from the, the disciples? Besides, we hear about the Paul apostle. isn't a disciple. I, 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 Who do, I would just encourage you to read the mm -hmm. book of Acts. Just, just read the book of Acts. Okay, now Jesus didn't tell the apostles to get sword. I'm sure he wouldn't have minded if they did, if you stick with my theory. But he told the disciples, whoever doesn't have a sword, get one. That's not difficult if it's self-defense. And we have no idea what any of them did. None. I don't think we're going to... We um, I don't think we're going to come to an agreement well, I could, on this. I'm, I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give me a I, name. I don't know what else to say. Comes up up in the agree to disagree on it. Comes up. Um, what, what, I think he's going to ask the right question. Though. Who comes up? Yeah, you're, who comes you're, up? Like, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. Misha, you're breaking up a little bit. So I think a little bit. Can you still hear us? Can you still hear us? Yes, I can hear you guys fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're way over. We're way over the hour and a half anyway. This flew by. Me and Steve just actually check the time and realize that we've gone um, an hour and 45 or an hour and 50 almost. Um, so uh, sure. I, um, I'm to be honest with you, I'm still just as confused as when I started. Like I, I see where you're, I can see how you, you can, if, you know, if you really stretch and make, try to make it fit that it, it would, but it's, it's just not something that, that comes out so clearly unless you, you know, you actively work to make it fit in there. That's just my takeaway. People might, you know, see differently, but um, it's just really hard for me to come to that conclusion just looking at it and with the other examples of like him instructing people to be um, sort of passive on how you should um, do it. I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't really buy into anything that the Bible says. That's just me. I, I, I don't, it's full of contradictions and, you know, it's, it's, it's contradicting itself all over the place. So, I mean, this is just another example of another contra contradiction to add to the list. And if it is true with what you put forth, um, Steve, anything you want to add to uh, what your takeaway is or anything like that? I, I just hope that all this talk about salt didn't make people bitter about it and leave them sour by watching this video. <laughs> oh man. What a bunch yeah. of puns. What a bunch of puns. I like it. Okay. Um, I, I, <laughs> I already used my grain of salt pun i had that one i was going to use that one um but i've already used it so i can't i can't uh i can't use it now but um uh, i'm gonna let you guys kind of t take a second and wrap up any last minute thoughts um your takeaways that sort of thing and then you can um you can plug your your channel or you know anything that you've got coming up social media all that stuff and then we'll go to steve to do the uh the super chat so um misha do you want to go ahead and start us out and just kind of give us a a, a sure a closing statement i guess a reprise. Yeah, sure. It's, yes. You're absolutely right. I mean, to, to connect all these things, uh, I won't deny that it, it, it's not prima facie. It's not just one page on full scap. But to go back to Luke, there's no way Jesus is about salt. Whether he is indeed talking about salt. Peter, the key, the key ingredient in gunpowder, debatable. But he's, he is talking about salt. Peter, the key fertilizer. There, there's no other way to interpret that. And, and that's really the nub of that article. And if people globbed onto that, I'd be happy. You can, you can forget the rest going back to Jericho and then going forward. I, I suggest the disciples would naturally have defended themselves as best they could to help spread the word. That's all. I, I, I don't mind if people can't wrap their heads around that. I admit sometimes I can't either, but to read Luke, um, his, his passage on the Sermon on the Mount, 
there's no way he's referring to salt. And, and it seems he's referring at least to the key, in, the key, the key fertilizer that, that we've used since time immemorial and still used to this day, saltpeter. Okay. Okay. All right. And Dr. Bowen, um, well, let me ask you this first, Misa. Where can people find you to, uh, like, if they, let's say they have any questions, anything like that, that they want to follow up with you with, um, where can they do that at? Sure. Well, uh, my, my old life was as a USDA organic inspector, and I have a website at isitorganic.ca. Of course, I, I, uh, I was living in Canada at the time, even though I worked for the USDA, so it's .ca at the end of that. All one word, isitorganic.ca, and I've got a contact page there. So nothing there relates to this, uh, although I have delved into biblical issues a few times in talks I've given and, and some articles, but no, that's just a good way to contact me. Are you related to a, a, a man named Peter by any chance? No, no. See, okay. in Russia, Popoff is like Jones. It's a common name. And no, Got it. Peter, uh, is, he, is he dead now? God rest his soul. Yeah, he wasn't. No, he's uh, still back. Always he's back at right. it. Is he's he? back at it again. <laughs> yeah, he's oh back my... on TV again. Oh, no. In Australia, actually. Oh, boy, actually, those guys never he, die. He, they, put him back, they put him on TV in, in Australia. But um, what about the oh, – does your family own a lucrative – uh, vodka line. Yeah, vodka. That's the other one I, I get quite often. Again, it, okay. it's a common name, and that one is spelled with a V at the end instead of two Fs. Of <laughs> I have. A, I, I was getting ready to say I, I blame. I, if, if that was the case, I blame your family for uh, for many of uh, um, strange wake ups. But um, since it's not you, then yeah, uh, since we don't have to go into that. All right, Doctor Bowen, um, can you uh, give us your takeaway and uh, where people can. Uh, Digital Hammurabi and all that stuff. Shill, shill, shill. Uh, well, I just want to say thank you guys, Kyle and Steve, Misha. I appreciate uh, really all of this, and it's been a lot of fun. And You know, I think that the one thing that I want to say at the end of all of this is that the last thing on earth that I ever want to do, particularly given what Megan and I do, is uh, try to hamper or put down somebody's uh, drive to do research, right? And I, I, I really applaud, and I mean that wholeheartedly, I applaud the research that you're doing. I think it's uh, difficult stuff to do. It takes a lot of thinking and, and trying to reason things. And I, I think that's fantastic. All, all that I would say is moving forward, um, take seriously. Um, I, and I, I, I don't mean this in like a, a demeaning way. I, I mean this in an honest way. Um, take seriously the critique and the criticism and the suggestions of people that, uh, that are in the field. So many people don't do that. And they just kind of keep going forward. And one of the things that can happen, and I've seen it, is that you, you know somebody might be going this direction with their research, and they they take the advice and they they steer just a little bit this way. They change something just a little bit, and they find that's the path forward. And it's it can be very similar to the path that you were going, um, but it, it just takes. But if you don't if you don't heed that you know suggestion or critique, and you just keep going this way, you may not find that path forward. Anyway. Um, I just, I, I, I appreciate what you're doing. I really, really do. And uh, I, I honestly mean, you know, no disrespect by any of this. Um, I think this is, this has been great. So you can find our other, uh, to plug our channel shamelessly. Um, you can find us at Digital Hammurabi on YouTube. Um, and uh, we do all kinds of ancient Near Eastern and biblical stuff. I'll be on our and Ra's channel tomorrow. Uh, it should be a lot of fun and I'll be back here on Friday. So then that should be interesting should be an interesting time so thank yeah, you yeah bring your game bring your game uh, for uh hey. god bless you for um thank what's you. his name Ad adonis Rael. what is it oh yeah yeah Angelus domino and yeah Angelus domino. angel of yeah, god. i can't wait for that can't wait for that um steve <laughs> any any uh anything else you want to up uh... oh yeah you got super chats go ahead just got super chats oh, to get out of the way. Okay, so um, Jake, three D, two dollars. Uh, F yes, non sec. Give me proof. Need a good case for God. Okay. Uh, Serbia wow, again, sure. two dollars. Uh, you want to get a good case for God? Misha, just hang, just hang tight. Wait, man. That, these, these super chats get rough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I I didn't know if that was good or bad. <laughs> I didn't I don't know. Know. No, it's they get know. rough. Just yeah. uh, just. Just, just got right. rolled the punches, man. Sometimes they sometimes they target you me bet. and Steve. Sometimes they target stuff that has nothing to do with what we had in the show. You just got to roll with them, man. But they pay to they pay to get them read, so we got to read them. Go ahead, Steve. You bet. Uh, 
Serbia, two dollars. Excluding people, how does salt independently prove God? Again, Serbia, two dollars. Does Satan fall before or after creation? Um, one more from Serbia. After two dollars. After after uh, after. Okay, uh, Serbia, two dollars. Salt plus li- uh, salt and light equals dualism minus spirit. Okay, that makes sense, Misha. Uh, does it make are you a dualist, no. Misha? Say it again. Your salt and no, light I, equals I, dualism. I like Mind and spirit, but but hmm. you do it here to yeah, Hegelian that's, that's dialectics, the and you, you you like Hegel. Oh, I like Nobody that theory Hegel. of ideas, but yeah, Hegel is a rough guy. But Nobody he, Hegel. He, he's <laughs> saying du- duality is, is the two metaphors. That's the mixed metaphor that I'm rejecting. I think. Yeah, Hegel didn't even like his own not, stuff. He was a very confused man. Okay, Justin James Human, five dollars in Matthew. It says. He cannot bring to peace to the world, but a sword, not a pacifist statement. Again, a contradiction, though, because it it, it completely contradicts what he said about turning the other cheek. And, um, you know, that's that's what I mean. Like, there's there's so many examples of him saying one thing and then turning around and doing the exact opposite of what he said before. I mean, it's just so like he overturned the tables and the money changers. Right. And he made a whip made of, you know, sticks. Right. Right. If you want to, if if you want people to come to you, this is my, this is what I think ultimately disproves everything. If you ultimately want the the um, the most amount of people that you can get to come to you as a god or a, a, that want them to worship you, you leave clear instructions and not instructions that are so open to interpretation or so contradictory that you break out into thousands of different sects of it you methodist baptists catholics uh you know unitary it just the list goes on and on why cause all that drama when you can just leave a b c d e in a in a pamphlet it doesn't have to be a book it doesn't have to be 66 ah. verse uh books of the bible it can be a pamphlet like a track this is how you get to heaven step one step two step three step four and then close it boom be done well they god tried that with the ten commandments and the Israelites couldn't follow it, so had something different, and that, <laughs> so that would maybe <laughs> imply that he make it even worse. Fallible, but, yeah. Let's yeah. make it even worse. Yeah. Let's start I with mean, ten, but then we'll add six or thirteen minutes. Let's do it. Okay. Just, if, if, if you're God, yeah. I mean, you can you can uh, leave a clear good. book. You know what I mean? Like, don't do this. Do this. Step A, B, C, and D, and everything else is just so into, open to interpretation. Like right now, tonight we had a discussion on whether he was ultimately a. Uh, telling you to be defensive or be passive when confronted. And all of us are right because we we can all pull examples of where he's being or telling people to be defensive and where he's telling people to be passive. And it just doesn't make any sense to be that to be so confusing if you're God. You don't have to be that confusing. Like you're <laughs> you know what you would know what to say. Anyway, go ahead, Steve. I, I, I'm I am literally convinced that just about any argument when it comes to the Bible, you can find pastors to support and passages to have evidence against. I mean, yeah, no Dr. Bowen, would you agree that for most things that seems to be no. the case? Absolutely. No question. Okay. Cause I mean, it, and I think that is leads to a lot of confusion. And I think that does lead to a lot of denominational things because some people latch on to things that they like and go, okay, I'm going to take this, but I'm going to reject this. And the other people go, no, 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 no. I'm going to take this and reject that. And that's how you end up with all these different denominations. But let's yeah. get through the last two super chats. Um, Ikinu Phi, thank you, my friend. Um, by the way, I'm going to put a shout out to him. If you haven't watched Ikinu Phi's videos, you're missing out. Yeah. I mean, they're very good. They're awesome. And they're funny. They're, they're hilarious. Good. Yeah, the dude is actually hilarious. I mean, he, he I don't yeah. know why he doesn't have more subs. I think his stuff's a riot. Um, he says, say? you're a nice man without a doubt. Um, just saying, or just wanted to say, I was older than you when I dropped this belief. Read the whole book from front to back. It might change your mind. Hmm. I didn't think he was that old. Can you find that was a kid? Like, like the he, is, 20s, he doesn't sound that old. old. No, he Maybe. doesn't at all. Hmm. Uh, Verisantium, one dollar. Thank you, uh, Veratiserum. Ver- 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 I think that's how you pronounce it. Jake, three D again, two dollars. Gunpowder goes poof, but no poof in salt. Any salt? Okay. I think it's salt. Gun- gunpowder more goes bang. It goes more poof if you add sugar to it. Uh, sugar, if I remember, slows down the reaction or something, and basically that's how you make a smoke bomb or stink bomb. Um, there was one more that came in. Saltpeter, sulfur, charcoal, and sugar. Um, and let's say movie fresh. Since there's any more that came in, 
one more that came in. Okay, that was the last one. So the the gunpowder goes poof, but no. I just read that. Proof I just read that one. In salt, any salt. That's from Jake 3D. Yeah, he says gunpowder goes poof, but no proof in salt, any salt. Yeah, the one I just read. Oh, did you? Gunpowder. Okay. Yeah, gun, three, Jake 3D two dollars. Gunpowder goes proof, was, but no proof in salt. I was responding salt. to. I was responding to some. I was responding to something in the chat and completely t- zoned out. Sorry really? about that. Well, Jake 3D, you got yours my read bro. read four times. You got yours read four times. So <laughs> it's a really Congrats. good comment, Jake 3D. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thank you both for being here. Um, although I, you. you know, like I said, I, I don't, I don't quite get the connection. It was an interesting conversation nonetheless to have, I think. Um, and I think that it's, you know, having these kind of conversations is important, even if we don't fully understand. I, you know, that, that particular side, at least we can try to, walk away with, you know, learning something new and um, getting a, a better feel for where people are coming from. It was certainly interesting. And I think you have to bend a lot to get to get there, but I can see, you know, in, a, in an odd way after you do all that bending where you're coming from. But I just think it's, it just would, it would be more simple, you know, if it were, if it were supposed to mean that it would be more straightforward, but that's just my, my personal opinion. Um, there may be people that, you know, this resonates with and that's really what you're going for anyway. So um, thank you both for coming on and um, having an interesting uh, talk tomorrow. We have, uh, Oh, I, we, ha- we do have uh, Misha coming back tomorrow. The other Misha, Dr. Misha. See, I back thought that I, and I knew that too. That's why I was confused. I didn't know what was going on. Yep. We'll be she's um, coming back tomorrow. Yep. That's actually digital Hammurabi's competition in the, uh, the golden nuns right now. They're neck and neck. So um, we'll see. We'll see how that turns out on Sunday. Yeah, um, but awesome. yeah, the, whether it's going to be, it's actually going to be the duo. It's going to be uh, Misha and Jerry together coming to talk about right. heretics, you know, throughout history. So um, it should be a should be a really good um, a good thing. And then Wednesday we'll have Miles Powers for the Jilly Juice Protocol, and then we'll be off on Thursday. Um, actually. I say we're going to be off right now. I actually might do an impromptu stream. Um, I was thinking about doing a, I make a killer dish for Thanksgiving. And you guys can let me know what you think about this idea. But I was thinking about going live and showing you guys how to make it. We'll, we'll put you in the kitchen with me. And um, I will go step by step on how to make this for, uh, and we'll, we'll just talk food and that sort of thing. So if you think that's, you might be interested in that, let me know. And, um, I'll see if we can't make that happen. And then on uh, Friday, Dr. Bowen will be back with us, as he said, to um, take on Lord Rael, Jesus incarnate. So, uh, yeah, well, you know what? I, we can just ask him, uh, Misha. We'll, we'll just ask him what he meant when he's here on Friday, <laughs> and I can get you a straight answer. Uh, yeah. Get it right from the Jesus <laughs> himself. <laughs> you you yeah. should have interviewed him first. What were you guys thinking? <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, we should have just we postponed this till Monday. That would have been a could have gotten the answer. Yeah. We'll just uh, we'll just ask him. All right. Uh, okay. I think that's all. I think that's all for that we've got. Um, One last minute just, super it, chat. Uh, Skeptic seven seven two dollars. Thank you. And by the way, thank you. We just hit seventeen thousand, and our goal is to get twenty thousand by next year. So if everybody's listening in the future that is watching this video, um, share it. Help help us out. Uh, you put it on Facebook, put it on uh, G plus, put it on, well, anywhere you have a social media, get these videos out. Cause I, I think that we're going to hit 20,000 by this, the end of this year. So does Kyle, that's our goal. Help, help us do that. We do appreciate it immensely. Right. When you share these videos, it does make a difference and we do appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thank you for the, this, uh, I mean, 17,000 in huge, right? The, in, in nine months is a little that's over, huge. a little overwhelming. So, um, Great. we definitely thank you guys for watching. Um, Except for you people that suck, you know, you guys suck and we don't, we don't thank you, but everybody else we, we say thanks to. Um, yeah. And, uh, they watch, they come down, but they watched. So that's fine. I they think, still suck though. Yeah. They still suck. They still suck. Uh, Saturday will be with brother Ernest. So that'll be awesome. Um, he, do, he thinks that Bruce Lee was a hoax. Uh, Rags and I spoke to him on the geek room. Um, it's fantastic. It's going to be great. 
So uh, oh, yeah, we'll see it. you. Uh, we'll see you guys back here tomorrow at um, eight p.m. Eastern for the Griffiths, that, where we will be talking about heretics and um, closer to your goal. That's what we're going to sign up. Well, we meant twenty thousand. It's not twenty thousand dollars, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Paul. Twenty thousand. Uh, too, but. Yeah, we meant twenty thousand subscribers, not twenty thousand dollars. I'll take twenty thousand though. I mean, if you guys want to, yeah, whatever, I, uh, that's, that's a goal that's that cool. I find. That's great. Sure. Actually, let's, let's switch that. it. We need we need twenty grand by by uh, by by Christmas. I like that idea better. So, um, it, no pressure, guys. I would, buy, I would buy myself a very good Christmas present, and my and pretty much everybody I knew, which is three people in real life. No pressure. So, yeah, no pressure. Um. So yeah, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Good night. Until then, take care of yourself. And hey, thanks. thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Non sequitur. Your facts are uncoordinated.